So at what age did you start to get excited about evolution and its related mechanisms? Um, it was my first year in college, I guess. I went to college knowing I wanted to be a biologist because I liked animals, but I wanted to be a marine biologist. And there's no biologist at some point in his or her career that doesn't want to be a marine biologist. You know, the thought of standing on the ship bow and watching whales, that's, that's not what most of them do. But, <laughs> but then I had a charismatic teacher, as is so often the case for many of us, who was an evolutionary biologist, and he taught freshman biology. And the guy was just so excited about evolution and taught it so well that, and then I took a class in evolutionary genetics the next year where we work with fruit flies. You can actually see things evolve over a period of a semester that I just got hooked. So I, I guess I was about 19 years old or so. You, so you, you, you actually did an experiment with, with fruit flies. Can you tell yeah. me a little bit more about how that, that Yeah, so that what happened? you do is you start with a sort of weak strain, one that has white eyes. So there's a mutation that turns their eyes white. They're normally red. And they can't see very well, so they can't mate very well. And that mutation makes them, you know, sick in other ways. And then you just put a couple of flies with red eyes, the normal fruit flies in there, which is a dominant gene, that is. If you have one copy, it turns them red. And you just stick a couple of flies in that cage, and then you just sample the uh, food cups, but that have the larvae in them every week and let the adults hatch out. And over a period of a semester, which is like 13, 14 weeks, right. you can see the, the frequency of the of the red allele go up from, you know, like 2% to like 70% or something like sure. that. And that's evolution in action. You know? it, it's, it's often said, I mean, that, that's a, this is a beautiful example because creationists mm -hmm. often say, well, you know, evolution can't be observed. They, they, they flippantly throw that out there. Yeah, well, Cotton in a case like that, they'd say, well, it's just microevolution. You know, there's still flies, antibiotic resistance in bacteria. There's still bacteria. They're not dogs. They're not cats. So oh, a lot of creationists will admit microevolution. After all, they have to. There's no choice. So. <laughs> but, you know, it's the sort of larger scale change that they have problems with. Well, not real problems. I mean, they know it happens. They just lie about it. So. But, but of course, I mean, saying, well, you know, it's, it's, a, it's still a fly, not a, not yeah. a dog, is, 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 is to, to some degree, I mean, completely misunderstand what's going on. I mean, uh, fl the flies that exist now, right, mm -hmm. have ancestors that go back mm -hmm. uh, quite a ways, same yeah. with dogs and so on. Yeah. So even those things are related, but it, it goes it goes back very, very, very far. Yeah, Richard's made this point of, you know, if you put everybody holding hands with their ancestors, there'd be this chain going back to something that was very different, <laughs> but in each step of the process, it would be very tiny change. And that's what okay. you're seeing there. Mm -hmm. You know, the argument is just superficially convincing the people that, you know, this is just microevolution. A fly is still a fly, but, you know, people don't want to think too hard about that, or else <laughs> they don't have the right kind of person telling them, well, you know, look, this little change adds up over billions of years into huge change. Oh, of course. I mean, we went from uh, more or less self-replicating simple molecules, mm -hmm. more or less, to what we are today. That's pretty convincing <laughs> evidence as far as yeah. I'm concerned. Um, what's at the top of your list of pending questions um, that are yet unanswered regarding evolution? Oh, geez, there's a lot of them. Um, I guess one of them is... Uh, well, all the questions of evolutionary psychology, I think, are quite interesting. That's a very hard discipline because we can't do experiments on humans as easily as we can in other species. But, for example, what proportion of our behaviors of modern humans have an evolutionary um, uh, basis? And what is that evolutionary basis? Figuring that out, I think, is an interesting question. If you're going to be sort of chauvinistic and dwell on our species alone, that's that's one interesting question. And if you're going to stick with humans, for example, what about human ethnic differences? I mean, why do Finns look different from Chinese, look different from Sub-Saharan Africans? I mean, what are the bases for that? Is it natural selection? Is it sexual selection? Is it just random genetic drift? Those kinds of questions are answered. Um, questions about, well, the origin of life, if you consider that part of evolutionary biology, um, that's proceeding apace. You know, how did life start? We're, we'll probably never know how that really happened. But I think, you know, if we can replicate the origin of life in reasonable prebiotic conditions in the laboratory, we'll at least be able to dispel the creationist view that it can't, can't have happened. <laughs> and it, there's a, I've often heard it said that, uh, that the, that embryogenesis is chemistry, uh, yeah, more or less. Not and evolution, and, yeah. and then, and then, yeah, and, 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 but also that biology is just a subset of chemistry. Well, sense. yeah, of course, chemistry is a subset of physics and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, we have our own 
questions. I don't. A, a quantum physicist isn't going to be able to address the question sure, of the we'll origin see. of life. But you know, and also after life starts, and once it begins replicating and, and natural selection takes hold, that's also something we haven't figured out because we don't even know what the earliest replicators were. We sure. they think they're RNA based, but we're not sure. So that's another question. Another one is, you know, the mystery of consciousness. How did that? happen I mean what is the evolutionary mechanistic basis for the feeling that there is an eye in one's head and was it an adaptive advantage to do that things like that so um, those are sort of three human related questions and of course there's a gazillion other questions related to flies and dinosaurs and things that are of interest as well. I mean we haven't discovered every every species on the planet in fact we're um, we found out that we are desperately lacking in our, yeah. in our knowledge you go to the Amazon and there's Billions uh, of stuff, which sure. is disappearing rapidly. So that, yeah, it brings up another question, which is, well, first of all, finding all the organisms that we can, but also uncovering their evolutionary relationships, yeah. mostly through DNA sequencing. I think that may be the number one problem, because before you can do any kind of evolutionary studies at all, you have to know the relationships of the organisms to each other. Sure. I mean, that's critical for my own work on speciation. <coughs> And so, I mean, task one is before everything goes extinct, find what they are and, and how they're related, mostly, I think, through molecular biology. So. Well, I appreciate you coming by and speaking with us. And sure. Um, absolutely learned a ton. Okay. It's very, very awesome. Thanks okay. so much. My pleasure.